Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to the continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we're, we're going to be talking about banking. Now, of course, banking is, is a, a, in modern terms, is a, a time, modern times, an, an essential for the passage of flow of uh, services and goods. But when we begin the story of uh, Florida as a territory, well, there was a, it was uh, something that they just didn't have. We, we turn our, our back to the story, oh, a, a myth, perhaps a myth and a legend, of old Francisco Moreno, who some say uh, operated a banking service uh, with a chest of gold under his bed, and it was he who did the money lending for the area. But once again, that is it. That may be true, it may not. But none of, we give him credit for it anyway. When Florida became a territory of the United States in 1821, one of the first things that was done by the, the new leadership here, including uh, Governor Andrew Jackson, was to apply for a certificate for a member bank of the United States Bank, which of course was the overall uh, financial wheeled financial organization for the entire country. Unfortunately, that that uh, request, uh, their appeal for a, a charter, did not go through, and it would be 12 years before Pensacola got a bank. Now, this went through a, this whole process went through a series of uh, of uh, requests of petitions that petitions that were made by local business leaders. But finally, in 1832, the territorial legislature agreed to this, and uh, even though the, uh, the governor, William Duvall, was against it, the uh, legislature overrode his veto, and in 1833, the Bank of Pensacola came into existence. Now, this, was, this bank was located on the corner of Palafox and Romana Street. It had a local board of directors, and the, the principal, the, the president of the bank, was a man named Walter Gregory. And it's from uh, Walter Gregory, of course, that we get Gregory Street downtown today. This bank put itself in order so that it was able to sell sh uh, shares of stock and then begin what we would call normal banking services, loans and uh, deposits and this sort of thing. And one of the major things that they wanted to do was to make the bank the financial organization for the sale of bonds for the building of a railroad. This was, of course, the time when the entire nation had railroad fever. Uh, people suddenly were aware that the building of a railroad would open whole new vistas to a place like Pensacola, which in 1833 was literally uh, uh, isolated. And basically, the only way we could get somewhere uh, in any, well, really almost in any form, was by sea. Well, the the new bank sold uh, bonds, 500 uh, uh, bond, basically 500 one thousand dollar bonds were sold. The railroad began its work and was proceeding nicely when the panic of 1837 came about. Now, uh, we, we must talk just a minute about that panic because it's one of the most unusual elements or events, rather, in American history. The United States Bank itself had been created in, its eight, in 1789 by Alexander Hamilton, who was our first Secretary of the Treasury. The, the Bank of the United States was a private bank. It was located in Philadelphia, and it was the instrument through which all of the national financial affairs were conducted, the issuance of care currency and all, all of the rest, and member banks could be created as had been attempted here back in, in 1821. Well, Mr. by the time he got to uh, his presidency, Andrew Jackson had taken an extreme dislike to the United States Bank, and he vowed that when its charter came forth for renewal in 1832, he was going to veto the bill and put the bank out of, out of business. Well, people said, now, sir, if you do that, we, we're in for trouble because we have to have some form of, of mechanism for the national currency and all that goes with it, the payment of debts and all the, all the federal obligations. Mr. Jackson apparently didn't see it that way, and so he allowed the bank's charter to lapse, and uh, for the next two or three years, the, the, con the country continued on, but then in 1837, it all collapsed, and the uh, result was what the historians call the Panic of 1837, which was a very bad situation. Fortunately, it didn't last too long because a, a substitute mechanism came into being. But that panic affected the Bank of Pensacola. Uh, it, it also affected the new railroad. Uh, both, ba both bank and railroad failed, the bank finally going out of business in 1832, in 1842. Now, we have to stop for just a second and recognize a couple of, uh, of functions that depend on a bank. Uh, there are some of these for which we really we have no, no answer, no, some questions for which we have no answer. For example, 
the, uh, when the territory of uh, Florida uh, was created and Escambia County was created, there was a, a, a mechanism for assessing properties, the value of properties, and for collecting taxes because you had to have a tax revenue to support local government. The question comes now, of course, where did the money go? How did, where was it deposited when the first tax collectors went out and collected taxes? Well, if there was no bank, where did it go? Well, some of the, the current uh, uh, tax uh, officials said, well, they, they must have put it on the railroad somewhere and taken it off to another city like Mobile. But there was no railroad. So basically, uh, we can only assume that the tax collector must have had some mechanism for burying the money in the ground or something like that, but we just don't know. And of course, the Bank of Pensacola, would, when it was operational for those nine years, it would become the depository for these funds, these tax funds. But then when the bank ceased to operate, in 1842. Again, there was no bank, and Pensacola did not have a bank again until 1873. That's more than 30 years later. Well, we jump, we'll jump through those years, the, the 50s and the 60s, and we come to the, to the early part of the 1870s. And of course, by now, beginning with 1870, uh, Scambia County, Pensacola, are just in the midst of a great boom because the lumbering industry has begun. We now have a new railroad running to the north. We now have the beginning of the fishing industry and the naval stores industry. And by the time we reach 1873, uh, a young man by the name of Francis C. Brent has saved enough of his money uh, from his hard work on the docks, and he has joined forces with a friend named Louis Knowles. And the two men create what became known as the Brent Bank. It was a just a storefront type of bank. It was a, a very uh, very functional bank, but of course, a bank in, uh, of that kind in those days was very limited in what it could do. And as a result of this, even though we were passing through a period of great uh, local growth, population growth, and there was a need for for people to build new houses, that kind of bank, the Brent, the Brent Bank, did not make home building loans. So uh, we passed through a period of this. Uh, of this uh, population growth and, and need when there was no such thing as a, a, a source of home loan uh, for, for such people. Well, we move ahead just a little bit to the year 1880. And in that year, two young men, two brothers, arrive here from New York. Uh, their names are Martin and Daniel Sullivan. And both of the, and the Sullivan brothers had made considerable money in other activities in New York. They came to Pensacola and they organized a new bank. And it was called the First National. First National Bank opened its office in uh, offices in a corner of what was then the Santa Rosa House Hotel. That, that was that corner. That bank was right on the corner of what we today call Jefferson and Government Streets. And the bank was highly successful. Uh, two years later, in fact, it was so successful that two years later, the Sullivan brothers had, uh, called a press conference and announced that they were going to build a new structure uh, on that same corner. They were going to tear down the old hotel. They were going to build a new structure. Their bank would be in one corner of it, but the balance of this huge building was to be an opera house. Well, people thought the, the brothers were, uh, were a little addled at this, but of course the brothers uh, had full knowledge of the fact that uh, there were organizations being developed in the north, which provided a source of ta regular talent which would come to Pensacola, and again the opera house was completed in 1885, and it did everything that the Sullivan brothers had hoped it would, but we'll be talking about that in another episode. Beginning in the early 1880s as well, we have three, four other things that we want to be sure we, we record in our story of banking. Number one, uh, Louis Knowles left uh, Mr. Brent and opened a new, a new bank on his own, which he called the Merchant's Bank. This was another private, privately capitalized bank uh, with a number of other leading uh, industrialists as part of the uh, shareholding and officer group. Then in, in, in order, we have the beginning of a series of what we in later years would call building and loan organizations. The first one uh, was, was called the, the Working Men's Building and Loan Association. It was operated once again out of a storefront downtown and its purpose was to enroll people who would buy shares. For example, a typical family would, would contract to uh, put in, a, a, let's say, a dollar a week, and that money would grow, and as their share matured at a certain level, then that family was eligible to make a loan for the building of their home. And this is the way many of the, the early homes would, were to be built. Well, within just a couple of years, we, we would have two more building and loans. One would, be, would ultimately be called the Mutual Federal Building and Loan, and the second one, Pensacola Home and Savings. Both of those were organized in 1889. So we had, uh, we had now be, we 
we had the uh, Brent, Brent Bank, we had the First National Bank, we had the Merchants Bank, we had three building and loans, and in that same year, 1889, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Knowles elected to sell his shares, uh, or rather to sell his whole bank to the to the no to the. Uh, Sullivan Brothers and the the two the his bank the Merchants Bank was was joined with the First National became a very huge bank for the, for the entire servicing of the area. At this point in time, Mr. Brent, who had been of course head of his own bank, now became the president of the First National Bank. We move just just a, a year or so beyond that, and we come to the uh, to the year 1892. And by now, with the uh, with the merger of Merchants and First National, people around town said, "Well, we we need another bank." We, we need something else to be competitive. And so a group of um, some of the leading uh, people, some of them were lawyers, some of them were, uh, were merchants, some of them were industrialists in lumbering. Uh, their names Robinson, Greenhut, Fisher, Clubs. These were, these were the men who came together and they created a new national bank which was called the, Club, the uh, Citizens National Bank. Now, we have to stop here for, to make make one thing one thing very uh, may, may, uh, not, uh, we have to stop here and make sure that one thing comes through. In those days, beginning with the time of the, the Bank of Pensacola, it was possible for a local bank with federal approval to, to print its own greenbacks. That went out of, uh, out of uh, service with the, uh, with the Bank of Pensacola. But in 1863, uh, during the war between the states, the federal government had passed what was known as the National Banking Act. And this permitted a national bank to issue greenbacks based on their own capital assets. That, that is basically having the money in the in the vault themselves and so as we talk about the first national bank and the merchants bank and then, and then of course the uh, the citizens national bank each one of these could print its own money with its look just like federal money but, but of course it had the local address and the signature of the local president now I must stop for just a moment here and and, and tell all our, our our listeners our viewers that much of the information that we're talking about today was carefully researched and put together in a very nice little book uh, by a uh, local resident by the name of Philip Pfeiffer. Mr. Pfeiffer put his story of banking uh, in book form oh, about 15 years ago. It's a, it's a treasure. And not only does he have all of the data on who the people were that did the, did the work and who were represented to share as, uh, as business officers, but he also has wonderful pictures of a lot of the, the money that was uh, the currency that was issued by these banks. And this, of course, would continue on uh, right on into the period up till 1913 when the federal government disallowed this. Well, we move, we move uh, into, the, uh, into the period 1900. We come to the year 1900, and by now banking is just flourishing here because business is booming. In the year, in the year uh, 1900, the federal census said that Pensacola had a population of about 20,000 people, and we had about 30,000 people uh, throughout the entire county. So by now, we, we were being served, of course, economically uh, by more banks because there were more banking business to do. And it was in the year 1900 that a group of men, uh, again, uh, led by, very, by leading citizens, and a man from Dothan by the name of C.W. O'Neill, who put together still another National Bank, and this got the name of the American National Bank. Now, the, uh, by the time we're talking about 1900, the First National had moved out of their original quarters in uh, in the Opera House, and that build, that that area was was vacant. And so the American National Bank moved in and put their headquarters in the in the space uh, in the Opera House itself. Now, now with the American National Bank functioning, we have wonderful competition between the banks, and it, it was very necessary because by the time we get into 1900, the lumbering industry is is having further expansion. And we have a number of people who are investing more in the development or hope for development of railroads here. And, and people are saying, well, we have reached a point now where we're going to have to do more and more to, to build roads to accommodate the changing tra traffic that we have in the community. We need more banks because we need more capital to work with. And so by the time we reach the, the uh, end of 19, the year 1900, that is where things stood.